So I came back to New York City. I was 30. You know, my friends were kind of looking to see what was next as you go back in the nightclubs. And what they got was me on the laptop showing them pictures of tumors and dirty water, saying, will you help? Some said yes. Some said, you're ruining my buzz. I'd seen all these problems while I was there. And, you know, the lack of education, people dying of AIDS, people dying of malaria. I just could not get this image of a child in a swamp out of my mind. I just thought, I, I can't believe we live in a world where this happens. And that's where the idea for Charity Water was born. So I'm going to talk about water as I started exploring it and, and what I learned. So the water crisis, right? Here's the big stat, which is almost impossible for all of us to comprehend. 800 million people don't have clean water. Well, I don't know what 800 million of anything looks like, let alone people without water. So I wanted to put faces and names and really understand what it was like to live without access to clean water. I was born in Philadelphia. I, I, I never had to think about drinking dirty water. The water crisis for my friends was a $10 bottle of Pellegrino at the club. This is what it looks like out there. 15-year-olds named John Bosco drinking from a swamp in the middle of his village. This is in northern Ethiopia where the community is just sharing an open well with their cattle. Lots of diseases, as you can imagine, associated with bad water. Some you've heard of, like cholera. Some maybe you haven't, like schistosomiasis, which is just a fancy word for parasites or worms. About 300 million people right now have parasites in their body crawling towards their liver. This child was a good example of that. She was drinking from a river in Athenai, Kenya, and every time she would drink, she would kind of spit up on her shirt. And we watched in horror, took the water from her, promised to try to help the village. But I really wanted to know what was in the river water that was making her throw up. So I took it back through customs, didn't really tell anyone, gave it to a lab, said, would you guys throw this under a microscope and make me a movie? And they did, and this is the movie they made. Now they said, we don't know how to break down all these different amoebas and parasites, but that water is definitely alive. No child should be drinking water like that. I learned that leeches were a huge problem throughout the developing world. Now I'm pretty sure no one in this room has struggled with a leech in their drinking water recently. But if you got your water from an open spring like this, you would. And you would learn that the big ones are pretty easy to filter out. That's not the problem. It's the little leeches that get through the filtration and then like to grow up inside you, and their favorite spot is the back of the throat. Two ways to get a leech if you live in a rural community out of the back of your child's throat. One, you use a stick and you scrape it, or two, you give your kid a little bit of diesel fuel. Just enough to kill the leech and hopefully not enough to injure your child. And this is how the filtration is done. Many communities don't have the awareness around boiling the water. Many actually can't afford to buy the charcoal to boil the water. I learned that schools around the world didn't have clean water. Now, if there was a second issue I would go after, it was probably education. I learned that about half of the world's schools did not have clean water or toilets. So how could kids get a good education if they had to wake up in the middle of the night, early morning, and bring river water with them to school? And when the girls got their period, well, they stayed home a few days because they were ashamed to go to a school with no water and no toilets. A lot of them would drop out and spend their time walking for water with 40 pounds on their back. Hard to imagine. You guys, you know, I just saw Brian before. He's like, yeah, it's really heavy. <laughs> That's like 1 400th of the walk that millions are doing every single day. It is heavy. I was in Malawi a couple weeks ago and just keep seeing stuff that I think is too good, like it's a story. Turn up in a village and we'd actually help that village get clean water. The place was called Cicada. And uh, th these villagers come from Cicada across this river and they say, well, we know that this village has clean water and we want to convince you and your local partners to bring the rig to us. So they started filling in a ravine. Because they cared about the water so badly. And we're like, yes, we, we will absolutely try to bring the rig, the rig to you. I said, where are you drinking water now? And then they showed us their source. And we saw pigs running around. 
Where's the dignity in that? A little farther down, the Shira River runs through Malawi. It's a beautiful river unless you drink from it. If you do, your biggest problem is crocodiles. Again, this sounds crazy until you hear the stories, until you actually see the scars. This community told us that well, a child had died in the last year in the community. And they, they built a little early warning system there. You can kind of see with the sticks. To the left of this photo, there was a pile of rocks to throw at the crocodiles. Farther down the Shear River, I met this guy, Smith. He said he lost his brother to a crocodile on this spot. After that, he donated his dugout canoe so the women could feel a little safer standing in it as they got the water. A guy actually in this village was in the hospital that day from a crocodile attack. Of all the stories, there's one that struck me the most. I've been to Ethiopia 17 times now. It's a country I'm deeply passionate about. And on a trip last year, I learned about this woman named Letikoros. I actually never met her, and this is a, a picture of a woman about her age in the same region. She lived 10 years ago. I was at a crappy $6 a night hotel room, and the, the hotel owner comes up to us and says, you're the charity water people. Yeah, we know what you've been doing here. We know what your partners have been doing. Let me tell you a story about this woman that lived in my village when I was young. And he starts telling me this woman's story. He said she used to walk, believe it or not, eight hours a day. Three hours out, five hours back. And she didn't have the yellow jerry can. She had this clay pot, which weighs 10 or 15 pounds, just empty. Then you put another 30 pounds of water in it. The water had dried up. You know, she, she can't move because it's the only land that she owns. And she lives off the land, so she walks eight hours. He said one day, she comes back into the village after her walk. She slips and she falls. The clay pot breaks, and all the water spills out. And he said she took the rope and she hung herself from the village, from a tree in the middle of the village. And he let that sit there. And then he said, the work you guys are doing is important. And he walked off. It was a great reminder that this is not about 800 million people as a statistic. This is about people, because of where they are born, who have no hope. So it's going to get happier. It's a solvable problem. Right? And if, there's, if you don't try and take one solution, one silver bullet, and jam it down the world's throat, there are lots of ways to bring clean water to people around the world. Sometimes it's a hand dug well, like in Liberia. Sometimes it's a drilled well. Sometimes rainwater harvesting, or, or spring catchments, or pond sand filters, or bio sand filters. At its cheapest, it looks like this, a $65 filter. It's the program in Cambodia. There's actually a lot of arsenic in the groundwater. But you can take surface water and you can clean it. The entire community gets together, they're educated, they agree to contribute $5 per family, and then actually contribute the labor. And this thing can take water like this and turn it into water like this. 